isn't it extraordinary how there's a moment in any full lecture theatre when silence falls and everyone expects something to happen. So I guess I'm the something to happen, to start with at least. My name's Carol Souter and I'm the Master of St Cross uh, and I'm really only here to welcome you to our college. I'm guessing quite a few of you haven't been here before. Is that a fair assumption? Okay, so double welcome. Um, we're here in uh, our wonderful new building which opened in 2017. So um, we are now able to bring people in for this sort of event in a way that we just couldn't in the past. So for those of you who haven't been here before, we're a graduate college. We have around 560 students, which might be a surprise to some of you as we're rather petite on the ground. Um, and we have students from all over the world. 70% of our students come from outside the UK and they are studying at graduate level every subject you can imagine. So we hope to have students and fellows from all four divisions of the university and are very pleased to be able to do that. We also, of course, have alumni all over the world and in the last uh, 12 months or so, we've been in Asia, we've been in Europe, we've been in the States and everywhere we go, what we're trying to do is create links between alumni and the college and fellows and the college. So, uh, fellows and our alumni. So this sort of event is fantastic from our point of view because it's very much about thinking forward from being a graduate student to what you might want to be doing next, um, how, you, how you can use your skills. And that's something that we're also trying to encourage the relationships between students and alumni to help build. So we're trying very much to put our recent alumni in touch with prospective students and uh, incoming students so that we can help share an understanding of what graduate study at o Oxford can give you. So we're absolutely delighted you're all here. I'm looking forward to a fascinating talk and I'm going to hand over to Philip to introduce the panel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you and welcome to everyone to Smart People Work Everywhere Using Your Research Skills Outside Academia. My name's Philip Bullock and I have the great privilege of serving as Director of TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities as well as supporting and facilitating interdisciplinary work, as well as making connections between the university and outside partners, and as well as facilitating public engagement with research and knowledge exchange. One of our main briefs is to make a case for what the humanities are, why they matter, and what you might do with them. It's very nice to be uh, asked to chair this event today in that capacity. First of all, I'd like to make a few thank yous. First to Carol Souter, Master of St Cross, and to the event team for hosting us. Secondly, to the Development Office, particularly Margot Courot, for organising and logistics, and of course to our speakers for their time and thoughts. I'll introduce them in a moment, but before I do that, it might be useful to sketch a little bit of background information about how today's event has come into being. It builds on Bailey Gifford's continuing engagement with and support for graduate work here in humanities in 2000, from 2019, Bailey Gifford will fund, together with the Arts and Humanities Research Council, four doctoral studentships a year for three years. They also support the Bailey Gifford Writing Partnership Programme, which aims to encourage and support productive creating writing habits as the research related skill and to facilitate new opportunities for peer monitoring. Speaking as someone who's been an academic for nearly two decades, I think I could probably do with some of that myself. Um, <laughs> certainly something I didn't have when I was a graduate student, and I'm very pleased that these things now exist for the current cohort. They've also run employability skills workshops for DPhil students. The landscape of employment opportunities for graduates is certainly always changing and evolving, and it's crucial to highlight, celebrate and communicate the skills that can be developed during a research degree and how they might apply to all career paths, as well as encouraging those who want to take on roles outside academia and to broaden their horizons and open discussions around other options. To this end, we will hear from all of our panellists, all of whom hold research degrees, about how they have used and continue to use these skills in their career to date. So to introduce our speakers, Michael Pike completed a PhD in Iranian history from the University of St Andrews in 2014. His thesis explored relations between Iran under the Shah and the Soviet Union. He's currently an investment manager in the long-term global growth team at Bailey Gifford, and his role entails researching investment ideas in a global portfolio of stocks with an emphasis on transformative trends. 
Kate Williams is an author, historian, and professor of history at the University of Reading. She studied for her BA and DPhil at Somerville here, and has written five, nine books, sorry, five in history and four fiction books, and appears regularly on TV and radio, presenting her own series, including The Stuarts, Restoration Home, and Inside Versailles, as well as discussing history and constitutional affairs on news programmes and channels. Mark Byford is a partner at Egon Sender, one of the world's leading executive search firms. Based in the firm's London office, Mark is a trusted advisor for global companies on CEO succession and on talent management strategy. He divides his time evenly between search and development work and is a leading executive coach. He's worked on the ground in this capacity in over 30 countries in Europe, Asia, North and South America, particularly in the life sciences sector. He has a first class degree in modern history and a DPhil in uh, 16th century history from Oxford, and also holds an MB from INSEA in France. So thank you to thank all you. of you for being here. Thank you. So my first question is to describe how it is you came from those backgrounds to where you are today, and how, what has been the variation and the breadth and the shape of the career uh, between finishing your research degree and the roles you now uh, inhabit? I don't know who wants to lead with that first. Oh, I was. <laughs> well, I, um, yes, I did my PhD at Somerville, um, and I was just like you. I was a research student uh, coming along to lectures, and I always wanted to write, um, but I wrote quite a lot of half-done books, and I can't say anything were very good. And then I decided, then I, um, while I was doing my PhD, I, I, I came across some very useful and exciting letters by Emma Hamilton, the mistress of Lord Nelson, uh, about... Uh, her relationship with Nelson, and they, I was I was sort of touching on seduction in my PhD in the 18th century, and these letters were very interesting in the way they interacted with seduction. So I thought these were brilliant, and I could use in my PhD, but I thought also maybe I could write a book on them, and it was just a sort of, I mean, a sort of rather overexcited, you never know thought. And then actually, I a friend who had an agent said, well, why don't you ask my friend as an agent? And I just sent this to an agent. I thought he won't write back. You know, six months later, got off with my PhD, and this agent wrote back said, you know, if you write this into, into a proposal, I can sell it for you. So I wrote a proposal which took about thirty thousand words, took me ages, same time as my PhD, and then. Um, and then, so when I, so I, I got the, the book deal for the book about Emma Hamilton, and then when I finished my PhD, um, I finished off that book and published that, and then published, uh, as, as saying, um, four history books since on um, uh, Queen Victoria, uh, Elizabeth II, uh, Josephine Bonaparte, and most recently Mary Queen of Scots, and four historical novels as well. And um, I and I started doing TV quite early. I didn't. I, I I would if I sitting in your position, no one. I would never have believed that I'd have ended up doing talking about uh, the history of Battenberg cake on the Great British Bake Off. I just wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> or, or you know, having. I mean, I, I love. I have lots of opinions. I'm thrilled that I can stick my opinions about Brexit and everything else are down the nation's throats on uh, Newsnight and all the other programmes that kindly invite me on. So I would never have thought if I was in your position. Um, but, uh, but then I, did, I, I was asked to do a bit of TV about Emma Hamilton, and then I did a bit more about Queen Victoria and presented my own show about Queen Victoria on BBC Two. And, from, and then I, and I started moving to doing a lot of news, um, and, then, and then it all sort of flowered. And I, now I think, you, I guess you define me as a public historian, a public academic, and I do you know, cover all kinds of... I, I've covered, done programmes on... Everything from I've done a history of opera program for Sky News. I was doing in Versailles about the um, the Versailles series, uh, restoration of home people's houses. Um, I've got a, a, a Radio Four program coming out on Christmas Day about uh, representations of the Queen on uh, like the Crown and, and, and shows like that. Um, so I so I do do and I do political programs. I covered the. Um, the EU referendum for ITV, that was a great night uh, covering that. And uh, in the Scottish referendum as well, and various political programmes like, and, and royal programmes. So, you know, I was just doing the remembrance services for BBC Breakfast or Sunday morning, and then I went to do them for CNN, which I have a contract with, and did them for uh, Macron's speech and the European speeches. So, so um, I, I, for me... Um, uh, of the spine of what I do is 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 the books, and I have my academic job as well. So the spine of what I do is 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 the books, and it was it was it was really I think luck that I got asked to just do a bit of TV about Emma Hamilton, and then they said well, why don't you do a bit more? Um, so and I've asked a few in preparation for the, for today. I've asked a few of my friends who 
our uh, sort of public academics, TV historians, and a few TV scientists as well. And they had similar experiences. They, some of them did a TED talk or they wrote a book or something that got coverage or they wrote an article in The Guardian that got coverage and then from there got picked up. And then after, after you've been picked up once or twice, then you have to start pitching yourself and you know, start, start, to, start to ask other people to take you on. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of where I began, really. But I, I would never have thought it sitting in your position I would never, never have thought they would have, I would end up on Gardener's World ever yeah. <laughs> well, we may come on to how to cultivate that kind of serendipity mm. and luck which is itself a skill but can we perhaps hear from Michael and Mark as well about sure. your um, well continuing on the theme of seduction actually um, mm. I was slightly different angle because I've studied Puritans so of course they weren't nearly as exciting as Ed Hamilton <laughs> um, but um, I'll come back to it I, I started with um You know, I I did a doctorate really because I came from a very, very un-sort of academic background. And I honestly thought at the end of three years, I just turned around and it would all vanish. (laughs) I just thought I needed sort of the boost of vaccination, if you like. And I was very fascinated in my subject. And I was lucky enough at the end of my second year to get a JRF. Um, So, in fact, I had five years here to do my doctorate, which is a sort of a luxury. Which So the fact that I was... (laughs) Finishing my doctorate as I started my next job was a testament to my procrastination rather than anything else. But um, but it, it meant the word that is quite important to me in all of this is identity. There was something in me. I mean, my family are all small business people, nothing grand, but you know everything from window cleaners to builders to shopkeepers. And somehow there was a bit in me. I used to sit in the um, and read the, the the Financial Times or the Economist. And to me, that was a bit of a clue that there was something I was interested in, I was curious about. And um, so while I love my subject, and I, I kept looking at some of the, you know, sort of the academic job market and occasionally thought, ooh, uh, it looks a bit tough um, and, you know, a bit risky. And I'm like, do I really want to be sort of somewhere sort of obscure doing this subject? And I, I, I was up for it, actually. But, but I was curious, I think is the right word, about alternatives. And that's what led me to sort of say, well, why don't I go to the career service, as it was called then, and just read a few things. And people had mentioned consulting to me as something that somehow used the intellectual side of what we do, but also allowed you to explore business, because I didn't feel I knew that much about it. I had done a job <coughs> on my year off as uh, at Harrods, so I felt like I knew quite a lot about selling televisions, um, <laughs> but I'm not sure that was <laughs> set for an international <laughs> career or anything. Uh, but it, but anyway, so so and I I mean there wasn't a lot then in the career service. I think it's a lot better now. But but there were one or two letters actually which just said, well, I quite enjoy this, and I, you know, and I was sort of, and they and they seemed to be they weren't doctoral students. Uh, I went in, so I applied as a, into the, what's called the milk round as an as though I was an undergraduate. Um, to uh, three or four companies. Um, the Boston Consulting Group is the one that sort of got curious and about me, and, and I went and did some interviews. And to our mutual surprise, um, I, I got hired. The, the, the seduction element is, is, they asked me at some point the fatal question for a historian, which is, so what do you know about statistics? And I could <laughs> sense this iceberg coming towards my Titanic. Um, and. Uh, and I said, and I just sort of launched in and said, well, uh, with not realizing what I was saying, I said, oh, yeah, I've got lots in my thesis. I've got seven year running averages of prosecutions for fornication and adultery in Elizabethan Essex. <laughs> and of course, completely derailed any questions about statistics, thank goodness, because that was about it. Um, and, and so I became, uh, the next year in the recruiting brochure, I think someone had written, oh, uh, yeah, we, have, we recruit everybody, including an expert on sex in the Victorian novel, which is how my, my thesis had transmogrified amongst my colleagues. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I, after a couple of years, I did an MBA. I didn't have to, but they sponsored me, so I, I, I did consolidate, if you like. And, and um, I found my way to, to health, actually, because the trouble is they didn't have a Tudor history practice, so, you know, <laughs> what's, what's the matter with them? But So I had to find something. I didn't really enjoy the banking piece, not to discredit banking, but it just didn't. But I did a project for Glaxo early on, on, on uh, migraine, and then another one on asthma, and then another one on AIDS. And I, you know, a couple of years ago, I did the, the work around the CEO succession at Glaxo, actually, or GSK as it now is. And that felt like a big moment for me. I've been working with this company for 30 years. Um, but so I, I now specialize in the day job uh, in health. And uh, I've been working now in pharmaceuticals for nearly 30 years. About 12 years in, um, 
I switched, uh, for a variety of reasons which I can go into in anyone's interest, so I switched into my current firm of Egon Zender out of BCG, mainly because I wanted to focus on people more, is the heart of it. And I sort of discovered historians actually, that's what they're interested in. Um, and, <coughs> and I get a chance to do that a lot, uh, both in terms of understanding what people want, what they might be good at, and where they might fit. And that's sort of in a essence. Uh, and, and in my development work, I do a lot of work in trying to understand how people are put together and what they might not realize about how they can change. So, that's fascinating. Um, so, uh, I guess I'm here for, uh, to speak to you for pretty much the same reason, actually, that I, I guess many of you have come along today. Uh, so I did my uh, PhD at St Andrews, and I was good of getting into my third year and starting to think about uh, career options. You know, what might one do next with a, a PhD in Soviet history? Not exactly particularly obvious. Um, and it was one of those days when the research was kind of going a bit slowly, and the you know departmental history email came round, and uh, because I was procrastinating, I sort of read all of it, um, and. Uh, <laughs> I scrolled to the bottom and there was a one line, literally a one line thing saying investment manager in Edinburgh seeks curious uh, historians. And I thought, what a peculiar thing to say. Um, so I thought, they must be nuts. So I thought, I'll look into it. And um, I looked at the website, I looked at the recruitment process, and um, I, I didn't know the first thing about in investment management or why on earth it might be relevant to me, but it, it, what they were saying about how... Uh, Right. You, could, you could apply research skills, uh, in, in this instance, to trying to find interesting investment ideas for people's retirement portfolios kind of resonated with me, and I'll explain why. Um, so it, it, in the finance industry, um, in, in cost, contrast to um, uh, what, what a lot of you uh, uh, do here, um, a lot of the analysis and the research isn't particularly rigor rigorous. A lot of it is, is, is quite superficial. Um, and I was quite struck by Billy Giffer's approach, which is to really look out long term and to try to kind of go the extra yard in, in research and really dig in um, behind things. And so I suppose it's, it's, it's kind of similar in a way to, you know, if you're doing a postgraduate degree, you're trying to find something extra. You couldn't turn up to your PhD vibe or your uh, hand in a master's dissertation where you've effectively regurgitated everything that everyone else has written. Um, and the, the, the same principle applies pretty much exactly uh, in what I do. You're trying to unearth different sources of information that other people perhaps might not have noticed and look at things in a slightly different way. So I guess as I kind of dug into it and went through the interview process, I kind of, that, that resonated with me. Um, and, and that's why, uh, although there might not appear to be from the outside much connection at all between doing a history PhD and, and going into investment management, actually a lot of the skills that, 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 you, that you pick up uh, at university are really uh, useful in that regard, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. Um, can I ask you a little bit more about, you made it sound so effortless so going from one thing to the next, but how you actually affect that change, how you prepare to segue from one thing that feels very familiar uh, into something which may be less familiar, um, and um, each of you have very different experiences of mm -hmm. navigating that process. Um, so, I think i answer it in a couple of ways. Um, Obviously, I said that very little familiarity with the investment management industry, still less with Bailey Gifford. So I reverted to what you might expect. I really kind of went in hard on the research, you know, who are Bailey Gifford, what do they do, went all through all the sort of videos and materials on the website and really tried to kind of prepare myself in that way um, so that I understood when I went to the interview the way that people thought about the business and the kind of things that they were interested in and what drove them. Um, but I guess none of that really prepares you from moving from a primarily research-based job where you're, you know, crudely speaking, you're, you're in libraries, you're behind a laptop. And I, I guess the, the thing that I found challenging is that over the three years of doing a, a PhD degree, you do kind of lose, um, or at least the soft skills do erode somewhat um, <laughs> um, in terms of, um, you know, so not do I do research, but I also interact with uh, the people who are our customers, our clients, who, who are uh, often... Uh, very uh, ordinary people who are on the boards of uh, some of the pension schemes that we manage and they will come in and they will say, you know, tell me about Elon Musk and what's he been tweeting this week and I have to give a, you know, a pretty uh, reasonable response to that. And, and also interacting with some of the, the, the people running the businesses that we invest in. So that, that, that was quite challenging and being completely candid with you, that did take time to get away from the um, sort of 
more academic approach to um, being able to sort of almost relearn uh, some of that. I mean, that will vary depending on what research you're doing. Some uh, research does involve a, a lot of interpersonal interaction, but uh, Soviet archives did not. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, didn't all getting, getting past, shout, shouted at quite a lot. Yes, so. getting past the librarians and archivists is yes, actually exactly, yeah. Yeah, serious yeah. soft skills, in my experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. quite hard skills. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it, it, it was a big change, I think, um, busily finishing off my PhD and then writing a book, which obviously use the same research skills as a PhD would, but your, well, you know, my PhD was, there was an awful lot of this chapter argues, this chapter will argues, which obviously isn't going to work in a, uh, a, a trade book. So that was a jump for me. I had to rewrite it quite a few times. And, uh, you know, obviously... It's a surprise when you, because obviously when you write a PhD, you have an ultimate supervisor who looks at your work. But when you write a book, uh, no one marks it. Your editor looks at it, but no one's going to mark it and tell you that your ideas are wrong or right. You have to, I was like, oh my goodness. And um, and so that was a, a change. And it was a bit of a shock doing TV programs. My first one was actually live. And um, I was, I think, when I look back at it now, I do look as if I'm rather rather in frozen with shock that I'm actually on TV. Uh, and uh, when I realised all these little things that nothing I possessed would, was, was appropriate for the TV, for this chat show's dress code. Um, but but I, I, it, it was a transition, and it was a, a big transition. But at the same time, I do genuinely feel that everything I did I, I as a PhD student uh, created the possibility of me, me being able to do that transition. I, I don't think that had I happened to just find those letters and think I'd write a book without having had my PhD, I just don't think I would have found it. Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if I'd have really done it in the same way because the, the levels of research and depth and the level of self-motivation that you get from writing a PhD, I think is... Um, <coughs> is uh, is vital in creating that as a future so I you know m many things I have done wrong in my career but n doing my PhD I think was something I never regretted and a few people said to me when I got my book deal they said well surely now you've got a book deal you're going to give up your PhD now and I said no I don't want to uh, but uh, and I um, you know, it wasn't ever, cons ever, ever a consideration but um, I do I do think I do think it was so valuable in, in creating this and I I, I mean, it's not a seamless movement, but I do see, you know, in a PhD, you're creating this big new piece of research and your aim is, once you've done it, just to communicate it to the world. And, and that's what I see myself as doing throughout my career, doing research, finding out new angles, finding out new things and, and, and communicating it to the public in a, in a public way. So I do think there's a, there's a there, although it's not a kind of straight jump, it, there's, there's quite a large amount in common in both, with, both, uh, with both roles. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I think that where I'd start is, uh, is not dissimilar actually in a way, which is that the, the PhD teaches you a lot, or DPhil teaches you a lot about yourself. We tend to think about our subject because we're so passionate usually about that subject and it becomes obsessive. I mean, I remember I was talking about, someone said to me, the people you were just talking about, they did die 400 years ago, didn't they? Because I, I got so involved. I remember in those days you used to have to sign checks for cash, which shows how ancient I am. And I, I got into the bank at one point and I could remember the month and the date, but I couldn't remember what year it was. So anyway, it shows you how I got a bit lost in my subject. But, but, but it teaches you something about you. And, and, you know, actually it changes how you see yourself. And as I said, in my case, you know, it made, it com I managed to convince myself that I could actually seriously <laughs> sort of study academic things uh, because, as I say, the, the image projected on me by my family was, you know, how on earth could this possibly be part of our identity? We all left school at 16 and here you are at 28 and what are you doing, you know? <laughs> um, so I had come through those sound barriers and it made me... So, so I just say, you know, in terms of how you see yourselves and how others who know you well see you, it's a great starting point because what you want to do is build a bridge from who you really are, not who you can't be or don't want to be, but who you actually are to, to something which allows you to be who you are in a different environment potentially and where you can continue to grow. So we often talk about potential, uh, you know, as you might imagine in what I do. So one of my jobs is to try and understand and help people uh, explore what they could do 
but don't yet do what they have literally the power in themselves to do and and that's really hard at this stage because you're very focused on your subject and also almost the learning about yourself comes along without you even noticing so so I think you know what I probably didn't do as much of but could have done more of was actually asking people who knew me well how they saw me what they thought I was good and bad at but also what they thought I could be better at if I you know was in a different environment um, and as I say you know I think there was some luck as well as judgment in quite a lot of my career actually um, but um, but you know one of the things which I've learned about myself is I am endlessly curious about people and I have a certain ability to to analyze and understand people and that's in the end where I've focused a lot of my time and it is a bridge between what I did in my postgraduate work and what I do now uh, but it took me a while to find it um, that segues very neatly into the thing I was thinking in hearing all those answers was about the role of people in your career trajectories and you talked about seeing yourself as other people see you. Um, do you still have mentors? Do you still have people you go and talk to to ask those uncomfortable questions about what am I doing right, what am I doing wrong or what could I do better? You all have these remarkable careers and trajectories but do you, where do you go to to get that advice and that support? and that occasional unsettling question about what you might do differently? Um, well, I, I, I think, actually, I've got a lot from my peers. Um, I find, you know, every time people often expect us uh, TV historians to be uh, at each other's throats, but actually it's a very supportive community and we get a lot from each other. And I, I feel, actually, I've got more from the, the people at the same level as me than perhaps I necessarily have from... Because I think that you, you know, you're, you, you know, you you sort of share advice and you share tips, and sometimes when one of you can't do a job, you hand it to your friend. So you you know, it works that way. Um, so, uh, but but the, and I obviously I have a, a literary agent and a TV agent who has, has told me, given me some hard lessons, both of them in the past, and some good lessons too, um, and editors and uh, you know di directors. But I I I. Yes, I mean, but I think, I mean, there, there have been people, you know, people who have been very kind with advice and very helpful with advice and, and generous with advice, absolutely, throughout my career. I'm not exactly sure whether I have been as good as I could have been at developing mentors. I, I do think there are people I know who have done better at it than me. I'm not, I'm not, perhaps I'm not very good at asking for help, I don't know. But I'm not very good at that, necessarily very good at that. But I do feel that... Um, you know, a lot of people do want to help you and to kind of assist you on your way. So I, you know, you're often struck by the generosity of people's spirit and what they want, what they want to give you as well. But I, I, I think with, with some, a job like mine, um, I, every day I work with different people. Every day I, will, I would, you know, I'll do, I work with a different team. I'll be doing a talk one day and a TV series the next day and then I'll be going to do a news programme next day and I might know, occasionally I might know the, the director from before but often I'll never have met them before so every day I'm working with different people and different opinions and um, and that I think is part of the challenge as well to, uh, so, you know, you, you don't necessarily have a long term relationship with them but you still have to accept, you, you have to trust that they are, you know, that, that, that we have to trust them even though you really don't really know them at all with what they're, with what they're telling you to do and what they're telling you not to do so so um a job like mine i think often isn't conducive to developing long-term relationships because you're, you're con i've got this portfolio career you're constantly working with different people but you, and you have to kind of build that relationship with someone with people you barely know um but uh but i but i like it <laughs> uh, i guess my answer is actually quite quite a simple one when we uh when everyone starts at, at betty gift you're assigned a mentor i was exceptionally lucky um in my mentor in my first year, five years ago, um, in Malena. Uh, she studied PPE at Oxford, I believe, um, for, for, for postgraduate. And uh, she has one very, very good quality in a mentor, and that is that she is exceptionally blunt. Um, <laughs> and uh, she is definitely not um, shy uh, telling me about uh, when I'm doing things wrong or, or doing things right. Um, and so I've actually, um, perhaps in contrast to your, your situation, Kate, um, I'm very fortunate in that that's been a relationship that's kind of developed over five, five six years and, um, yeah, it's going well uh, so far. And it's quite, quite nice that she's sort of at the stage of her career five years ahead of me, so she's gone through the kind of stages that I go through so I can kind of uh, bounce ideas off, off, off her. Um, 
So, yeah, um, and that's generally the case for everybody who, who joins our firm. You're um, assigned a mentor and you um, can keep them for five years, I think, and then after that you can change if you wish, but it's generally speaking it's a, a constant through your, for your career. And also eventually encouraged to do mentoring yourself. Um, so I've just started this year, which is uh, quite a terrifying prospect. <laughs> so, um, you suddenly find yourself in the position of having to um, I, I think it's you know, saying it's actually a very, very difficult skill to, uh, to cultivate being someone's mentor because it's, um, we, we have somebody who comes into Bailey Gift to do, to do a, a session on how, how to mentor. And she had this phrase where it stuck me. She said that mentoring is a continuous process of letting go. And that's actually very true that um, when you have someone that, um, uh, and they're uh, have smart and self starting, that the last thing you want to do is sort of micromanage them. So it's sort of, providing um, a, a constant but not interfering too much and it's quite a difficult balance to get right but I guess that's my take on it. it sounds like Candidly like supervising a PhD um, yes, in many ways the <laughs> well, process of letting go when someone is becoming an authority and becoming themselves. Well, yeah. I was going to say that was my, my first mentor was undoubtedly my supervisor and um, mm. in retrospect I realised that I chose Penry Williams who sadly died a few years ago but but Penry was, I chose him really because he was a fantastic human being. It wasn't that he wasn't a good historian, but actually the one thing he was probably less, much less interested in in Tudor history was religion, which was what I was studying. <laughs> um, and uh, so I sort of teased him all the time about that. But, but, uh, but he, was, he, he was someone, I mean, he didn't know about, you know, going to the Boston Consulting Group or any of that stuff, but he knew a lot about human beings and he was just a very sensible person who I knew believed in me and you know I just kind of thought that was kind of helpful so that was probably the most helpful mentor I've ever had um, at different points I think you know the person who recruited me into BCG the person who subsequently recruited me into Egon Zender both of those were um, women I admired hugely and who were really important actually in my you know continue and actually the person who hired me into Egon Zend has just become our chairwoman so they go uh you know so a fantastic uh, human being but I, I mean I, I guess that's that's all I would say is that they're hidden in plain sight they're usually right in front of you the mentors you just have to dare to ask them to help and they could be a relative they could be a friend it could be as you say a peer uh, some peers are much older sort of what they call you know wise souls or whatever much better than people who are like my age you know <laughs> so just uh, find somebody that you think tunes into you and really understands you uh, and then ask them. usually they'll help and thinking about the transition maybe from graduate research into other careers um how does one identify the pivot points are they clear when they're happening is the moment of change evident or is it only in retrospect that you see something was changing and how do you learn to think now is the time for a change how, uh, that sort of dis, dis, the thing that's happening to you in the moment and then the retrospective realization that it was that way it's a difficult thing to ask historians because we all start thinking well am i imposing something yeah. on what was actually <laughs> happening yeah. you know, or am i really remembering what it was like i think it's easier in retrospect <laughs> Uh, I remember, Net, was it Man Nastyazja Mandelstam who said Soviet history was the only one where the future was certain and it was the past that kept being reinvented. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I think, um, uh, again, they were moments of understanding myself better. So, so, uh, so for example, when I finished in, uh, with BCG, there was about a year and it was interesting, I, I was heading for a partnership. Uh, in my own mind, I was ready. Interestingly, in the mind of uh, the London office where I was, uh, the financial services people who I wasn't working with, I hadn't been at all clever in preparing the ground and they didn't think I was ready. In fact, one or two of them thought I would never be ready. Um, and, um, and they delayed me for a year. And it was only a year, but it, it was actually providential because it really made me think, because I was like this. <laughs> and I was heading for this thing that I really wanted. Um, and, uh, and it was my wife who actually said, you know, I don't sure you're going to be really happy as a partner there anyway. So I, I sort of decomposed a bit what I loved and what I didn't. Um, and I, I would say to all of you, actually, um, just it seems a really obvious point, but it was very helpful for me. Um, look for where your energy is 
So when do you feel inspired and in the flow? And, and what is it about those moments that tells you something about you? And it was when I sort of recognized that parts of my job were doing that for me and other parts weren't, uh, that I realized you know, what I, where I should go. They're like, that's a great compass for you. And so, so all my pivot points, I mean, I haven't had many, but all of them have been about that. In, in, in Egon Zender, we have evolved as a firm from being very much about executive search, which is sort of literally finding people to do roles, um, into a firm where it's more about uh, leadership, which means it may be search, but it may also be helping leaders become better at what they do rather than moving them anywhere. Um, and, and I've had my own journey in terms of getting much more involved in, in both of these aspects and how they link together. And again, it was what, where I felt really excited and sort of, uh, you know, in, the, in flow. That's what gave me the clue to sort of make those switches. I, I think as it relates to in investment, um, the, there are, it sounds axiomatic, many, many different ways of, of, of doing investment of many different styles and some people will be more comfortable with, say, a style of investment where you buy things that are very, very cheap and a bit beaten up and wait for them to grow in value. And some people are more comfortable with sort of faster growing, kind of um, perhaps more controversial technologies. So it's, it's kind of two ends of the extreme there. Um, but there's many different flavors uh, in between. And I think it genuinely does take time to try and figure out. And, and one thing that Bailey Gift is very good at doing is um, almost forcing you to do different years in different types of team that do different kinds of investments, you kind of come to a conception eventually of hopefully what, what works for you. Um, being candid, that I, I think took me about four or five years to really work out what, what worked for me, so it definitely didn't happen overnight. But I think it's, it's, it's um, so that to, to answer the question, I don't think there was any particular pivot point. It kind of um, happened naturally, but um, the team where I work on now, um, you know, stocks like Tesla and Spotify certainly provides endless entertainment, and that's, uh, uh, I think that's what what really works for me. Um, so, so it's sort of ha we have a very very few stocks in our portfolio, so it works well as a former historian with a quite a narrow focus to have a, a few things to concentrate on. Rather. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'd say there's no particular point, but in any career, it will take you a while to kind of. Uh, uh, get to a stage where you you've, um, feel like you're comfortable with what you're doing or maybe decide that it's not for you. I mean, that's also a possibility as well, right? So. Oh, uh, I mean, I think, yes, I think I could isolate pivot points. I think my first book, I think, uh, obviously, uh, my first television show, I think, and then I did... Um, an MA in creative writing at Royal Holloway and worked with Andrew Motion and from there I really started to take my fiction writing seriously. I had written before but I never really liked them, got, got them to finish. And then I started taking my fiction writing seriously from then on and ended up um, being a lecturer at Royal Holloway. So I, I think I do see, did see pivot points definitely in my career. And I also, there were, there were points I thought, well, I did, see, I thought, oh, this will be a pivot point. This is going to change. This is going to get me the things I would like. And it didn't. So uh, there were some ones that I, you, uh, maybe I'm too optimistic, but there were some ones that I didn't, that didn't pivot. But I think I definitely do see them. Um, and, but I think, I think that some opportunities do become pivot points and some don't and you just perhaps have to try and grab as many as you can and and throw as many at the wall as you can and then see which ones do generate something because it I I mean the big ones but there's some smaller ones there's no logic necessarily to which ones you know which which today program appearance got picked up by someone who said I want you to come in and talk to me about this? When I did, there were plenty of other today program appearances where me and John Humphreys had a, 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 a sort of knife out debate, and then that was the end of it. So you you I think I think you don't always know and yourself what they are, but I think that some of them can be you know you, it's just a case of hoping that one of them will uh, throw them at one will stick. These stories of your own personal trajectories and experiences and the experience of looking back and identifying is, is very helpful. I wonder whether we might just turn the discussion, because we'll open up to some Q&A later, to how you look at other people in this world and what you think the skills are that researchers have that they bring to the things they do, but what they don't have and how they might learn those other, other, other skills. So thinking about the future generation of people 
going into academic careers, but also going in particularly to <coughs> non-academic careers. What do they have and what do they need to work on? It's a bit like looking at yourself when you were back then, <laughs> and sort of thinking, gosh, what was I like then? Um, I mean, I, I guess if I, again, I did, if I did personalise it, I think I would, I didn't know what I knew and I didn't know what I didn't know. So again, it encouraged, you know, encouragement, I tended to think, oh, I didn't know anything. And that was true in some areas, but it really wasn't true in other areas. And I, I was just a bit unaware of, you know, how I would be viewed by others, you know, what, what people would see me as good at and what they wouldn't. So I guess the first thing is to be curious about yourself and about what, you know, and, and to ask, you know, so talk to people who've gone out into the world already, uh, maybe a bit less seasoned than me, you know, sort of like two, three years in and, and check with them you know, now how they see, because I think it's very hard when you're sitting in your seat to know. Um, I, I would say that, you know, research tends to make, doesn't necessarily tend to make you, um, it tends to make you more self-conscious than self-aware, and and people are a little bit in their own heads, and, and you know, they're not very, necessarily very good at communicating how they feel about things, as opposed to what they think about things. Um, and yet many jobs actually would, benefit, for, including academic jobs, by the way, uh, from, uh, from knowing how people feel. Uh, so, so, I mean, it sounds a bit weird, but getting in touch with your feelings is actually quite helpful. Um, and again, uh, you know, that, that's certainly something that I noticed. And one of the, the reasons I went into health was that I was actually quite good at understanding the R&D people in pharmaceutical companies, because although I'd done history, uh, there was some common you know, there was some common sort of DNA uh, in this group, and, and some of my colleagues who hadn't done that type of thing found them really hard to understand and a bit strange. Um, and I, I was obviously quite fairly strange myself, so that was, that was I had that in common. But I, I think that's, that part of that was the sort of a intensity around your subject, which can be a little bit of a barrier from others. Um, so, so learning to sort of put yourself a bit, in a bit more perspective and and just listen to, to what you're feeling as well as <coughs> processing everything through the, the left hemisphere is quite helpful. Um, I would say the skill that you definitely all possess doing um, uh, research degrees or even as undergraduates is, is intellectual curiosity. Um, and, and in particular, um, uh, I guess, a, a willingness when you do research uh, to kind of go the extra mile and try and find new sources or perhaps travel abroad and, and interview people and it depends on kind of what what research you're doing but um a, a similar um rationale uh, applies to investment um, if we were all sat in edinburgh pleasant though that is it's a wonderful city behind our desks sort of trying to dream up you know what might be the next amazon or the next apple or the next um stock investment that would do very well for our clients probably that's not going to go very well we need to you know get out of our bubble go to china uh, go to some of the parts of the world uh, which are not suffering from, you know, Brexit, for example, um, and uh, go and um, you know, be a bit curious, talk to talk to new people, find new sources of research. One thing we put a lot of emphasis on in, in my job, which might surprise you, is actually academic sources of research. So we uh, tend to um, have a view that, say, if we're writing something on artificial intelligence, for example, there's absolutely no way with a history degree that I'm really going to be able to understand uh, some of the basic principles behind that. So uh, in that specific instance, we have a relationship with Delft University uh, in the Netherlands, so uh, we do these kind of things. So it's, it's, you might think of investment research as perhaps being a little dry, you're kind of you know, sat sort of behind a keyboard or you know, on the phone, or, but it's, it's genuinely not like that. Um, one of the most senior investors in our firm, he's called James Anderson, who's a very, um, in many ways a very odd character, um, periodically walks past my desk and criticizes me for being there. So saying, well, what are you doing here? You know, get out, go somewhere, and do something interesting. Um, and you, you genuinely all have the have the have the ability to 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 do that because otherwise you wouldn't be uh, doing a, a postgraduate degree. And I think that's um, you know, certainly something that's 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 really helpful if you've got that already got that drive and ambition. It's just that you're applying those skills to thinking about what might happen in the future rather than an, analyzing. Um, uh, your academic subject or in our case um, historical facts well I mean I I do think that your 
have such amazing skills. I, I think that a PhD, uh, do you feel, is hard. It's definitely tough, and I found it hard at times. There were times it was going well, and times when I have to say it wasn't, uh, and I did struggle forward. <coughs> and I, so I think that what you have is incredible. You have so much determination, so much self-motivation, um, so much unique original thinking, and so much intellectual engagement and curiosity. So I think you've got so many tools already I, I mean you know sometimes people say to me don't you get scared going on tv and i felt like saying no i did a phd at oxford nothing's gonna scare me ever again because <laughs> i managed to get that thing in um and uh but and, and i mean for me uh, obviously you know my life is, is a bit different uh, the main thing i had to get used to really i think was um that in, in my phd i was quite organized and i planned ahead and which sources i'd look at and which books i'd look at and tick my books off the list and kept and I had to be more, much more flexible in the way I lived. Um, my first TV show, it was actually, there was a, it was a Rich and Judy, in the days it was a Rich and Judy chat show, and it was about uh, Nelson and a friend of my, well, I made friends with someone else who's writing a book about Nelson in the archives, and he rang me up and said, look, they want me on the TV, and they want a woman, uh, will you do it? And I said, well, tomorrow, and I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit busy tomorrow. I said, well, I'll find someone else. I said, all right, all right, all right I'm gonna do it. So, you know, I had to kind of think to myself, you know, I have to jump tomorrow, and increasingly, you know, I did a Remembrance Sunday um, commemorations, a great honour on Sunday, and of course we'd known it was going to be the end of the, the commemoration of the end of World War One for quite a long time, I'd say, but still I got phoned on Friday saying, Are you free on Sunday, Kate? And so I, some, you know, I have to take a view whether or not, so like, there are two things, you have to be, I have to be flexible, and sometimes when I think there's going to be something happening, I do carry tv outfits in my bag around with me and 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 also i you know and you have to kind of take a you know you think no one's phoned me for this this event yet but i bet they will so i'm just going to keep it clear just in case and sometimes they don't phone and i'm just sitting there you know yeah just have a day but sometimes they do so so i think the biggest thing i had to learn was um being uh, uh, working to other people's time frames and uh, you know because and I feel that one reason why I have got did get more work is because when they phoned up I, I just said yes I'll do it you know even if I was ill or whatever and I mean I, my, my daughter's birthday is about the only thing that gets uh, excluded everything everything else I'm not sure I haven't done something on my other half's birthday maybe I can't remember but uh, that's uh, a really it, super point though because um, I remember <laughs> if we're slightly I mean I don't get called for TV for <laughs> never know after this has been filmed <laughs> but, uh, but, but you know um, uh, in a different way I was very passionate about as I think we all are doing this sort of work about truth um, and I realized that, you know, without compromising on, on that, truth is time and resource limited. So if a business has to make a decision within two weeks, uh, they want, you know, if they're, if they're using someone like the Boston Consulting Group, they want the best possible answer they can get within two weeks. But there's no point having a brilliant answer in three weeks, you know, because it, the decision needs to be made, you know, the, 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 the opportunity will pass. And so, um, you know, making the, not making the perfect the enemy of the good was my version of what you're talking about, Kate, which is actually, you know, I needed to get used to the fact that my sort of passion for looking at everything to the nth degree uh, was nice, but wasn't very relevant <laughs> anymore. Now, that may not be true for the thing you go into, but you have to get used to the idea of this agility, you know, that, that the world is... The deadline. Yeah, the yeah. world is working to deadlines, which may be great and long. I mean, you know, you invest for 20 years, maybe, for all <laughs> I know, for a pension. Yeah. But if we're making a decision for, you know, to, you know a couple of weeks or a next day, yeah. then you, you, you have to reapply, you know, what you've learned. Yes, I remember being contacted by the University Press Office. Um, a newspaper wanted a statement about the BBC War and Peace adaptation, and I said, yes, I'll do it. Um, is three weeks okay? And they said, we were hoping by midday tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I took a deep breath and wrote the piece, and it, it yeah. had that strange ripple effect, and it was widely syndicated, probably much better than anything I've laboured over for every mm. adjective and comma in the right place. Mm. So I think that's a, a very yes, good Yes, I, have, I have occasionally frantically written an article on my phone, and the thing <laughs> is that you're out doing a filming phone, you're just like, oh, I just write it on my phone, you like, yeah. count the words manually, which is just yeah. so weird. So yes, I, but uh, yeah. yes, it's other people's deadlines, and I think you know that they 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 won't change. You know, they, yeah. they won't change. But not a technique to apply to your transfer of status or confirmation <laughs> of status or the submission of your PhD. So uh, haste slowly uh, would be there. Um, we would like to have, I think, if time for some questions, because I'm sure we have things that we haven't touched upon or perspectives that are there in the audience. Is there a roving mic, or are we going to be able to just hear? 
Okay, so I can see one, two, and three initially. Yes, yeah, so I'm for that. Okay, yeah. Uh, one of the things that you sort of told us the history of like the moment where you decide to choose, but one of the things that we're trying to like balance at the moment personally against my third year is that there's very strong pressure to sort of like begin the next step in the academic path already. Mm. The publisher will perish, all of these cycles and things you have to get in on the academic job hunt, as you were saying. At what point did you make that commitment that you're actually going to sort of pursue the career as of academia and break off and say, okay, right, I'm going to stop like shopping my articles around to the journals? Because that seems to be quite like a moment where you actually have to think, <coughs> right, I'm just I'm going with one way or the other. So I just summarised that quickly because there are people in another room who won't have heard that. So that was a question about, uh, yes, how you plan for a different future whilst finishing the PhD with all the requirements and thinking also perhaps of an academic future simultaneously. If that's a okay summary, yes. thank you. Well, I'm a really bad example because I, was, I had this lovely JRF at New College. I was in La La Land, really, and so I was not uh, doing all of the careful steps uh, that you know, so I, I should have published much more than I did. Um, I was doing seminars and things. I was I was doing that type of thing because I really loved it. I was a bit too much of the procrastination brigade when it came to actually. I was I was writing fine and I I, I finished it fine, but you know Dermot McCulloch would say you know sort of uh, you know your thesis has been far too often pulled out of the Bodleian because it's still not fully published. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think I was a good example. And I I but I. I would say, look, I still, I'm still, I'm writing a book at the moment on the Hampton Court Conference. I still love doing the research. It's now very it takes forever, and it's done in spare time. But I, I guess what I would say is, you know, um, without trying to sound naive about it, I would try to to give yourself the options, um, and just do them because you love it, and and uh, you know, but but try not to make that sort of close off every other option. Um, I don't think for me there was any particularly um, clear moment where I decided one way or the other. Um, I'd also been pretty poor at publishing, if I'm honest, so maybe <laughs> the decision might have been made for me. Um, <laughs> but if you're not interested, I, one, thing, one thing I did do was um, I, I found in my own conference for my uh, subject area, which is actually a great thing to do, I really recommend it because it means that you get to listen to actually lots of other people and you don't have to actually give a paper yourself, so it's actually quite a good way of doing it. But, um, and actually kept that going outside, um, um, uh, outside academia, I'd say I do it every two years. Um, with, with, with my co-founder. So there are definitely ways of keeping in with, with, with academia if you choose to go down alternate. It doesn't have to be completely mutually exclusive. Um, I, I think it's, it's perfectly possible to sort of slightly have your cake and eat it in, in that regard. But I think specifically to your question with regard to academic career, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the way that it's set up these days is that it is, as you put it, publish or perish. So, um, and uh, any senior academic will, will, will repeat that point kind of ad nauseum that you've got to really have the have the publications to to get in on that job depending on your subject area but um so uh, i think it, it, it's important as is my to give yourself the the option but it you don't necessarily have to kind of um throw all your eggs in one basket or you can continue after uh yes i think i, I think um well, I'd finished my PhD and I'd written, I'd written a few articles and I'd published a few articles and I'd my PhD and then I panicked about getting my book done. So I kind of got frantically trying to get the book done uh, because I didn't want to be late with my, with my book about Emma Hamilton and then, and then, and then kept up bits and pieces of my old research and, um, and, uh, and then I had a couple of years away from academia and then went back, went to Warhol away and now I've got my professorship at Reading. Um, so I've sort of gone around the houses a, a bit, but I, I think I, I think I, I, I don't know. I don't think I ever made the de decision. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to be an actor. I think I always. I kind of when I was being a PhD and writing, I also I also wanted to be an academic, and and I just was going to get my book done and then see what happens. So I was never really had a clear moment, I think. But um, but yes, I I uh, yes, I don't think I don't know, yes, if you do. I just had a question for us to think about as academics and as supervisors, because to get a place, to get the funding, you tick the box saying yes, I'm embarked on an academic career, and yet we know that we are training the future generation of academics, but simultaneously training people in skills which will go elsewhere. And I think that's one 
but we still need to think about um, as to how we present those training opportunities and skills and are realistic about the things that people want to choose to and end up doing. Um, yeah. Um, I, I hope it's okay to ask questions just to Kate mainly. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, I guess, a little bit of the dread two-part question. Firstly, I mean, I guess many of us are here because we're worried about the whole academic precarity issue, even if we you know, might want to pursue something academic. It seems potentially like more public-minded history still has quite a lot of potential to be precarious. And if you would suggest anything that we might do at the very beginning stages to kind of, I don't know, feel our way through what seems to be a relatively broad and fraught landscape. And secondly, if you think that anyone can be a public academic, or if their topic has to already kind of speak to what the public might want <coughs> to do. <laughs> so can I just summarise for the other room? It's very strange to have you. Yes, how, do you want, how does one cope with precariousness? Um, and then can anyone do the kind of things that Kate has done? Uh, uh, is, any, is any academic topic transferable? Or? Uh, well, yes, very, very fascinating question. Um, I think uh, to answer number one, I think yes, being a being a being a uh, being a freelancer in any way is is precarious. You know, you're, you 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 can be cancelled, you can be people don't pay you, all these kind of things. Um, uh, but it has benefits in it as well, and but I, and I do think that. Uh, early stage uh, historians can be exploited, I have to say, by um, um, some thing like TV companies who are just looking for some people to get them, give all their free research, and then they, you know, they'll say, oh, we'll use you, and you never do get used, and things like that. So, I mean, I've been burnt a few times, but, and, and, and that now I'm, uh, so, you know, so I do, I, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think that they, you can be burnt and you can be exploited. Uh, I, 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 like all freelancers can, and the whole like, would you just mind doing this for free kind of thing? But I do think that the rise of social media has has really helped in that respect. I think that you young historians, if you want to go, and young humanities, if you want to go and do public engagement, you can use um, social media to have more of your voice out there. If someone exploits you, you can just tweet about it. I did actually tweet once about something, and it got so it got like more retweet more retweets than my fascinating tweets about all kinds of things. <laughs> that that and my neighbour's cat, you know. So I, I did you know so I did this you know retweet about someone who just said yeah you could just do all the research and, and we'll get a guy to present it. So I just tweet about that. And um, so I think I, I think that social media media can be a real voice for 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 you and I think I think social media is really important uh, to for public process and I think there are lots of people making their own little videos and their own little uh, own little um, podcasts and things that you need things that don't rely on commissioners and that you know you can't just say oh yes I gave all that work to someone and they've now stolen it so and and I think books are forget forget books are actually expanding because you know, there are, you st it is still good to go down the straight, you know, the, the straight publishing route, the conventional um, pre pre big public publisher, because they'll be very supportive of you and you know submit your surprises. But it can, you can, you know, self-publish, and lots of my friends have self-published and made a lot, made, made actually they claim more money than the rest of us like that. So I think, so I think, um, I think, or I think it's an I think the precarity of of being a public uh, public engagement is is an absolutely real point, and I, I'm glad you raised it. But I think that. I feel that your generation is is perhaps it can ensure themselves more against it than mine did because because you can because you can you have social media in which you can kind of craft your own voice and craft your own Instagram you know pictures of things uh, and uh, and so that you're not so that you know when some TV company says yeah well just give us all your research and maybe we'll use you and maybe you won't you can just think oh <laughs> I don't so I think that's that's a really good question and number two um, can anyone be a public historian I mean I would say if they let me on then. They're, they're, they're like, but I think, uh, yes, I think that my subject, I have to say, I don't really talk about on TV very much. Um, it's expanded much more, and I find myself talking about all kinds of things. I mean, I have no, I, I, had, I did not know anything about the history of Battenberg uh, but, but, but until the Bake Off called me for that, <laughs> and the history of the tulip, and all kinds of things. And I have to say, I didn't really know an awful. So you, you know, you have to research them yourself and fast. Um, and um, when I was doing restoration at home, I, I did on did medieval houses, house history, which of course I began having been in the 18th century, so I knew nothing about. So actually. My, my PhD supervisor did write to me saying, oh, "I've seen you. I've heard you've been on TV about these things. I'm not sure your thesis would have got you there." And I think, I think he was right. I think, I think that, I think that my so I so I talk about all kinds of things. So I think that some subjects you you are right absolutely can be very, very. It, you can be very of the moment, and you you can be seized upon that. But then after that, you know, you need to write more books and more things, so you can expand. So I think that what I don't, I think that all subjects can in in. T interact with what the public wants and I think it's actually expanding because it seems to me that the public appetite for 
what I think in the industry is called leisure learning is, is expanding every year. People want to know more, and they want to know more about you know, like you were like you were saying about the serious context behind war and peace. You know, that that's what that's what they want. So I think, you know, all of us, uh, they, they they think there are more opportunities. So I I, I don't think that um, one is. <coughs> Uh, um, uh, restricted from being a, from being a public humanities from from the subject one is doing, and I uh, certainly I haven't yet. I've, I think I managed to talk about my PhD. I think twice. That's it. So in all the hours of TV and radio I've done. So, but uh, but I'm, I'm pushing for more. So yeah, one day I'll make a series about it. But uh, at the moment not. And I think that has to be generically true for everyone. So obviously, I you know Kate knows about this particular thing, but but you know. You know what people will hire you for, so to speak. Whatever it is, is for your, you know, for your, for this curiosity, for your mind, for for you. It's for you, and you are more than your subject. And it may not feel like it when you're in the third year, and it's like, you know, chapter nine thousand four hundred thirty-six, part B. Uh, you know, it feels like I am only my subject, and but it, it, it you know, that's not why you're going to get hired. And even if, you, even as an academic. If you go in with a particular, <laughs> immediately, you, as you all know, because you're probably all doing teaching, you have to teach all sorts of stuff that you don't feel you really know a lot about. And so that's life. You know, it's, it's, it's going to stretch you way beyond your subject. And it's an interesting moment. It's, there are questions about what the humanities are, where they fit in the university system. And yet, as Kate says, there's an enormous thirst for intelligent TV, wonderfully curated exhibitions, cinema going. And that's something I think we ought to seriously draw on as one of the things that, we, that validates what it is we do within the university and in academia. There are two questions just to the back there, yeah? Um, has having a PhD ever counted against you when <laughs> So for the people who weren't there, has a PhD ever counted against any of the speakers when applying for non-academic jobs? Um, I had to get rid of my round metal glasses fairly quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have contact lenses. Um, I, it's funny, I had two sets of business cards, one for Germany and one for mm -hmm. everywhere else. In Germany, being hair doctor by foot was terribly useful. Yeah. It meant I was a real person, unlike all the other Anglo-Saxons, as far as I could tell. Um, but, but everywhere else, I, I was just Mark. And um, so not really, but that you do get... You have a certain, at least in my case, and it may be, as I say, my glasses and everything, but I had a certain stereotype that I, I, I needed to sort of um, move beyond. And, and, but it was probably as much about me as it was about anyone else, to be honest. It was really, you know, how did I see myself? And it's a bit relating to the previous question. You know, my identity was all bound up in this thing I'd done, and I couldn't really see much further than that. And so as I learned to see myself through others' eyes, I realized that actually, you know, the time I tripped up on this was when I, I was too much Dr. Byford and not enough, just Mark. Okay. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say that having a PhD is, itself has ever counted against me, but definitely one thing I picked up during a PhD has, and that's uh, verbosity. <laughs> um, so the, the first team I joined in, in Bailey had a rule that the, your, your investment port, report had to be three pages or less and for every fraction you went over three pages you got 10 seconds deducted from your 60 second pitch that you had to give to the team for your whatever your stock idea was and I had this great idea I thought oh I kind of run over it a bit so I thought I'll sort of you know expand the margins a bit and maybe reduce the font size slightly and um, obviously I got found out so I got my uh, my introduction my first introduction docked to 20 seconds <laughs> so I had to explain uh, whatever company it was I was trying to explain people in 20 seconds. So um, that's not been uniform. There are some teams that maybe you know, write a little bit more than just three pages. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, when you're writing a thesis, which is 80, 100,000 words, you know, you'll know that you know, one word will never do when you can replace it with 10. Uh, so I have found, and it's been a very useful process, actually, to kind of sort of... Um, uh, condensing thoughts into a, into a more succinct format. In fact, I've probably gone too far the other way now. So, well, Some of you may have done the three-minute thesis uh, exercise, uh, oh, people gosh. nodding in the room, which is not quite 60 seconds, but in academic terms, that's pretty brief, isn't it? Uh, and there's uh, another question there, yeah? Uh, so, sorry, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I'm not exactly from humanities, and so I have a question. So related to this one, so uh, I'm very scared, for example, of interacting with people outside academia because this, you know, I, I know how to interact with people inside mm -hmm. academia. So did it affect you when you started, say, working outside? And uh, 
Another question, which is unrelated to this. Uh, so did you ever regret leaving academia? Or if you if you would have a choice to start it over again, would you continue current path or you would try to do something else? So again, that was uh, how does one learn to, to interact and speak with people who are not from your academic milieu? And the second one is, do you regret giving up academia? Um. <laughs> um, gosh, well, um, I, uh, I, I think that I interact a lot with people who might have been, not have been academics, but because they're all you know, promoting the arts and in publishing and, and that kind of industry, it was it was uh, it was similar, I think, for me. So I, because I didn't go jumping into business, it was very different. It was it, 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 you know you spend a lot in the same way you talk about ideas and similar. It was so it was a very similar similar. It was a similar kind of communicating strategy, I think, in discourse. So I was, I think you, you probably had more of a jump than me. <laughs> um, do the second one first. Do I ever regret leaving? Uh, academia um i would say that i'm very lucky in that my company is mostly populated by people who probably would have been academics in another life so it doesn't really feel like i've left it the place kind of feels a bit like a library sometimes uh, which is which is which is really good um I, as i said before in answer to uh, uh, one of the previous questions i do try and sort of keep involved in my uh, in my in my field um kind of in my spare time um to answer the first question i think the most difficult thing uh, for me was um, so whether that's you know you're interacting with um, in, in, in the in the broadcasting contact uh, sort of kind of strong-minded personalities and uh, in, in in the business world as well from um, dealing with some of the the leaders some of the companies we invested can can be very um, difficult people to to deal with um, they're often quite secretive often very very blunt um, often very nice actually and very very different to some of the kind of TV kind of or media perceptions you might have of them but it's a it's a fundamentally quite a radically different thing from when you've you know interacting with your colleagues or uh, to, to dealing with people who uh, often have in, in my case have have created businesses pretty much from scratch and and obviously that's takes a certain kind of personality and a certain set of qualities to be able to get to that point and um, when you turn up to effectively interview them you have to be very prepared and um, it's that, that that did definitely take a while to kind of cultivate that but I, I think that one thing that, to be a bit more positive about it, one thing that those kind of personalities really do appreciate is if you've really done your research, because for them, their businesses are their children. I mean, they're kind of like a, for a lot of founders, they've really labored over things for years. So if you've really taken the time to try and understand it at a deep level and you turn up and you're not just asking superficial questions, that can really, really work to your advantage. And it actually it is very helpful if you can form a relationship on, on, on the basis of that. They might be willing to open up a bit more and... and um, uh, give you a better better sense of um, uh, what they're about and the opportunities of the business than you than you would have got if you just turned up in a sort of business mode and sort of just asked very basic questions. So it, it can actually be a very positive thing, but you do have to sort of slightly realign the 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 the, the way that you conduct those conversations, I guess. Now, I wouldn't be intimidated. Um, I mean, there are intimidating people, sure, sure, but I I, I think. I would be curious about them rather than scared of them <laughs> and and let them be curious about you because typically that's how human beings work actually so if we're scared of people then they react to us as a as an object but if you get curious about why uh, you know and the passion bit, yeah. so you you know in a sense as you know saying that sort of understanding the founder mentality um, getting under their skin uh, which you have all the capabilities to do uh, is a very powerful way of bringing a different view of them because most people will react. It's Newtonian. They give you force, you'll give it back, sort of in terms of scared or whatever. Whereas if you actually get curious about why, um, suddenly that's a new world for them, which many people aren't equipped, like you are, to actually explore. In terms of giving up academe, I, I, I think that's entirely in your head. And I, I haven't really. I mean, it's a, sometimes it was almost a fig leaf. You know, I would, but I still, you know, read. Um, <laughs> I, I actually collect now 16th and early 17th century books. I have about 2,000 of them. Our wow. house is full of them. I talk, I, I teach with them. I'm doing a class next week in New College with the English undergraduates on, on called, we call Beyond the Text, about the book as an object. So, uh, you know, this is, a, as, you, as you were saying very eloquently earlier, this is a beautiful 
opportunity you've had. It may feel sometimes like, my goodness, what on earth have I done? I've created myself into this weird, you know, whatever. But actually what you've done is create something uh, very special and, uh, and that will be with you forever. But you, you need to sort of leave space for it in your heart and um, then it will continue to grow. Don't, don't be afraid. I, you know, that I'm sure that you know. I think I think I completely agree. What the the skills that you need to get through a PhD, such a unique original point of work. I mean, you can. I feel that having done a DPhil at Oxford, you can do anything. Yeah, bungee jumping the whole lot, you can. I'm I'm sure of it. <laughs> um, there is an opportunity now to ask questions over drinks and to. Uh, do that. So I know there are people with questions in the room, but I'm not cutting them off. I'm just giving you another forum to press to, to, to raise them. Curiosity is a wonderful word because what I want to do is highlight Bailey Gifford's Curious Minds alternative in internship programme with a deadline of the 23rd of November. So if you want to try your hand at curiosity, there's a chance. It offers four internships of £5,000, is that right? Yes, and two right. weeks in Edinburgh. So there's an opportunity to put some of the thoughts you've heard today into practice. Write, about, write about whatever it is that yep. you find interesting in the world and we give you money to go and do it. Yeah, easy. Um, within Oxford, there are people you should talk to. Here in the room, we've got Caroline Thurston, <coughs> Eleanor Pritchard from Humanities, Social Science. We also have representatives of the Careers Service. I think I just want to wrap up by thanking our panellists, by thanking Mark. Michael and Kate for their conversation and their experience. To our hosts here at St. Cross, to our organisers at St. Cross and in the Humanities Division, and to Bailey Gifford for supporting the AHRC Match DPhil scheme and the writing partnerships, and for you for being here, for your attention and your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>